Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our panel, Moving In, Through, and Across Landscapes, Waters, and Memories. Before we begin, I'd like to express huge thanks to Artsy for hosting the Atlantic World Art Fair and to the nine galleries from across the Caribbean. Thank you to our lead sponsor, Butterfield, and to Lisa Howie, especially a Flat Pony Gallery in Bermuda, who is leading this inaugural art fair and the cohort of nine women-led spaces. I'm here with my colleague, Holly Bino. Together, we are the co-founders of Sour Grass, one of the nine partners participating in the Atlantic World Art Fair. Both working out of Barbados, we are artists and writers, and also the co-founders of Caribbean Linked and Tilting Axis. Good morning, everyone. Today, in collaboration with Suzy Wong Presents and Turn Gallery, we present a conversation called Artists in Dialogue, moving in, through, and across landscapes, waters, and memories with guest artists LaVon Bell, Edouard duval Carey, Deborah Jack, and Tessa Whitehead. During this conversation, they will address intersections in their work across the varying thematics and speak about complex histories, how complex histories, places, colonization, nature, and spirituality have influenced their practices. To kick off, we will share short biographies for each of them before diving into the meat of the matter. And we invite you to leave comments, questions, and remarks below in the YouTube discussion box. We will be using the last 15 minutes of the conversation to address them. To start, Tessa Whitehead received her BA in Fine Arts from Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design and her MFA from the Slade School of Fine Art at UCL London. Whitehead's most recent solo exhibition was at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas in 2019. She's also represented or she also represented Pop-Up Studios ICVA at Volta NY in 2016. And she has participated in numerous group exhibitions across the Caribbean, the United States, the UK, and Europe. Deborah Jack is an artist whose work is based in video and sound installation, photography, painting, and text. Her current work deals with transcultural existence, memory, the effects of colonization, and mythology through rememory. As a multimedia artist, she engages in a variety of strat strategies for mining sites of cultural memory and negotiating a global present. Her work has been exhibited in solo and group shows in the Caribbean, the US and across Europe. Levan is a visual artist of Trinidadian and Bajan heritage, raised and resident in the US Virgin Islands. She works in a variety of disciplines, including video, performance, painting, installation, writing and public intervention projects. Exploring the material culture of coloniality, her art presents counter visualities and narratives. Levon often reconfigures fragmented histories to create new multi-layered topographies. She is exhibited in the Caribbean, the USA and Europe, and recently finished a solo exhibition at the National Nordic Museum in Seattle. Levon holds an MFA from the Instituto Superior de Arte in Havana, Cuba, an MA and a BA from Columbia University in New York. She was the 2018 to 2020 fellow at the Social Justice Institute at the Barnard Research Center for Women. And finally, Edouard Duval Carrier is a contemporary artist and curator based in Miami, Florida. Born and raised in Haiti, Edouard fled the Papadoc Duvalier regime as a teenager 
and resided in locales diverse as Puerto Rico, New York, Montreal, Paris, and Miami. Parallels emerge between the artist's cosmopolitan lifestyle and his artistic sensitivity toward the multifaceted identities that form his native Haiti. His works have been exhibited in major museums, art institutions, and galleries in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Edward creates works that speak to the complexities of the Caribbean and its diaspora. So we'd like to welcome you all to the session today. Yes. And to, to open up, we thought of asking a question to the entire cohort, and we'd like to invite you to feel free to answer in whatever capacity you're called to. So first up, how do you consider the material you work in in relation to some of the shared thematics of landscapes, waters, and memories? Are there other considerations that might allow us to understand how you think about scale, texture, surface dynamics across in your works? And, and, and whoever is most comfortable, you can feel free to jump in and share. I'll let the ladies start. <laughs> um, let me just make sure I'm, I'm, I'm not muted. Okay. Um, the most the most recent work that I've been doing, the collage series that's in the fair, um, I, I've i been working a lot with uh, thinking about my work as a counter archive to the colonial ones. And um, in the hurricanes in 2017, um, with Irma and Maria, I had lost a lot of my paper, a lot of work in my studio. And some of the roles that were able to be saved, they're at what I thought, that didn't have mold on them. When I tried to roll them out, they actually were damaged from the storm. And I remember thinking that I was going to, uh, you know, I couldn't use them. And someone reminded me, but Levan, your work is about archives. And, you know, this is an archive from the storm. I mean, maybe you can find a way to use it. And so that kind of started me thinking about how could I use this torn paper um, that was already damaged from the storm, but somehow repiece it together to create these collage series. So it's, uh, I mean, I think, uh, you know, when we're thinking about choices of materiality, there's a lot of when we're processing our ideas and what is the best form that it could take. And for me, that process of taking the ripped paper and making these drawings um, collaging it together, I think, is really indicative of the process as Caribbean people when we think about our torn and shattered histories, how we begin to build them, to create something new. Um, that also is reflective of the violence of the histories, but can also be quite beautiful. I mean, I guess for um, me, what's interesting for me is the work in the fair, for instance, has um, a lot more material than maybe um, I'm used to working with, um, you know, being a video artist. I mean, I use photography, but I like to use you know, straight photography. I don't tend to do a lot of, um, uh, you know, editing to the images. And so coming out of film, so film has a materiality to it because you're working in a dark room as you process. And then as I shifted to digital and doing digital video, um, you know, I think of I think of the space and I think of sound as those types of materials and try to build layers into the images when I'm editing them. But in this work, using the actual salt brought me back to, in a way where I started, um, right after grad school, I started working a lot with salt um, as a material and had stopped for a while. I was using it conceptually, but not like the actual material. So that's, um, so that's always interesting as a, a shift in, in thinking about the process and um, actually working with my hands in a different way. But also thinking about sound as a material. So one of the images, the hurricane image, for instance, um, that's in the show, you know, the, the bar of color that's there is actually then the sound um, of the Rosby whistle that I use in video. And so at one point I I would, while I'm editing, I tend to look at my screen and I would look at it and be like, you know, this is really beautiful, <laughs> all these sort of color blocks, but it's the part that's invisible, right? When you're watching a video, you don't see my edit timeline. Um, and so I started printing that out, like taking shots of that and printing out that sort of like color grid and bars and wanting to work with it. So, um, and having that become visible, right? And it's a sound that's invisible, the Rosby whistle, you can't hear it. Um, and then to make it visible by having it in a timeline, an audio timeline, and then printing that out and adding it to the image. So, you know, I, I, I like working, um, 
with the materials and thinking of sort of challenging ways and ways that I can sort of play with that um, and our notions of what those materials are and how they function. Thinking about cutting and making sound visible is kind of um, in a non-digital way, right? And sort of like putting it on paper. It's almost going in reverse. Usually you write the score and then you, you know, then you play it and you hear it. So, um, so yeah, so for me, it's, it's all sort of malleable in a way. Well, I'm very, I'm very interested in um, in history and usually content uh, and that that type of content in my work is very important. But at the same time, I'm also very interested in playing with different materials and I've always uh, applied different um, techniques or you know like support or or ways of doing things. I mean, and depending on the project, I find it you know like I mean I try to find the appropriate. Uh, um, support and technique uh, for the content that I'm trying to, to, to display. It is always um, challenging to bring something or try to bring something new to the table, but it is important, you know, like in that way. So um, I feel that it is my, I mean, yes, the histories of the Caribbean, the post-colonial and post-colonial, um, visualizations that I try to bring to the table are sometimes of like total concoctions because definitely there there wasn't a proper history uh, written you know like for the for the region I mean so it's always seen through um, the, the I mean the perceptions of you know like either European powers or visitors or but you know like I try to you know like rethink those and present them as fairly as I can, and as uh, 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 I mean, to create a discussion about how they, were, I mean, these stories were uh, were perceived, and how we can, you know, like today, revisit them and really reposition ourselves in the process. Um, so, to me, that's very important. Um, I think of my practice mostly as a, the meat of it is as kind of sketching of drawing and, um, and then the different materials um, that come for the final product are, um, are kind of largely uh, performative. Um, and I like to play with those material, the kind of history of those materials. I think the most interesting one or, for me is oil paint because it's a little bit problematic, I find, uh, to use oil paint within the Caribbean. Um, but I was went to school uh, because at the time that felt like that was an important thing to do, to go somewhere else to educate and learn how to oil paint. So I, I use it, but I try to be aware of the, the, um, the history of oil paint and when I, think about the content, how um, I'm taking ownership of it or how it's taken ownership over my content. And so being sensitive to those um, kind of literal histories um, can also just add a really nice layer of, of um, interest in whatever topic you're diving into with that project, I find. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about how, and you touched on it a bit, Edward, how our histories and our landscape and our waterways are mediated through um, cartography, through the telling of our histories, mapping agriculture, tourism. And I'm interested to know how in each of your practices, you're developing a new lexicon for us to have another entree into the landscape and the water you know, outside of this very heavily mediated history and environment that we all inhabit. But, yes, for me personally, uh, the I mean, the history of the Black world, the Black Atlantic, all of these uh, uh, visions were not written really by the, the ones that suffered or the ones that were, I mean, put through this uh, ringer, as, as I would say. But it, it is time for us to revisit those stories because, I mean, since the beginning, I mean, the destruction of the Indies, I mean, the, the you know, like, I mean, the, the, 
revolutions. I mean, the, the slave trade, the, the, all of this, and, and the idea of the commodity behind these things are very important to me. So, you know, like when you try to place, first of all, historically, that, that voyage, that, that Atlantic that we had to cross, um, it's, it's a, I mean, how do you feel about it? You know, I mean, it's it's very in, in, interesting when you do the exercise of putting yourself in the position and the place of whom, I mean, the millions of slaves that were, you know, like transported in that way. And uh, what did, they, what, I mean, how did they perceive it? What were they bringing with them? I mean, all of these things have to be revisited because, I mean, the idea of, you know, like, yeah, they are Africans, but Africa is a gigantic continent and has so many uh, different people that showed up. And to really, you know, like put it on a plane, you know, like uh, that they are just, you know, like slaves or whatever. It's, um, I mean, one, there's a lot of studies to be made. And I follow very closely with the, with the academics that are involved in all of these researches because I find them really interesting. And second of all, really much more telling of the histories that followed, you know, like, and who we are today than anything else. So I really look uh, very closely and I've organized exhibits along certain, certain I mean, such themes uh, uh, as, you know, like what was brought, you know, like uh, uh, as foods, you know, like to the, you know, like by the slave trade. I mean, little things like that, that really, I mean, complicate and inform our lives today. And it's, it's very important that, you know, th these are really put straight, I mean, so that, you know, like it's not a one linear kind of things written by somebody else. And um, and to complicate the, 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 the I mean, the canons of, of what what is perceived to be Caribbean and even New World, because I mean, the whole of the Americas, I mean, has a similar history. I mean, yes, the Caribbean was first impact, first contact, first uh, whatever, but you know, like the rest of the, the more I, I'm, I'm in the south of the United States and the more I'm around here, I mean, the more I, I see the complexities and how this history has been completely once, I mean, told in, in a one-sided way. So I don't know how the, these, my colleagues here feel about that. And um, I mean, and I think to me, it's, it's an important task that, you know, especially us in the Caribbean, we've been looking at these things, you know, like studying them and, and really not really i mean it's time for us to grasp it and 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 try to present it in a different way i mean and that's what i try to do at least and i i think i look to um you know going off what um edward was saying i i you know i look at, at the scholars of the region right and i think about how they reimagine this history and our, our sort of space in it um i think from for me my art is a way to renegotiate a lot of those um stories, right? Because that's what history is. And so to counter the kind of hierarchy that academia has, um, bringing sort of folklore or stories or our artist imaginings um, into play, I think is a way that we, well, for me, I counter um, that kind of, of, of positioning of, of, of the space, right? And so, and and in doing so, I think gives it more, more breath. Um, I was thinking, Specific, no, not specifically, but lately I've been looking at um, Catherine McKittrick's idea of the ungeographic, right? And so when we think about how geography with a capital G has sort of been enforced on the region and, and the world, it really was for issues of mapping for trade and for labor and for the movement of, 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 of cargo and human cargo, right, across the ocean. And so um, counteracting those those lines that are actually on the map right and looking for a different way of, of sort of thinking about um, how we navigate the water right which is fluid so it's already ridiculous to think about placing a grid on top of water right because it's always in flux um, and so for me my work is always thinking about that renegotiation of of water and land and the point where they meet, right? And how that point is in direct, um, I think resistance to the idea of mapping and a fix, the fixed notion of the map um, and of the delineation of borders. And so, um, so I think, for, you know, I think art practice and my art practice is, is always sort of like poking holes in, in those ideas and thinking about the shoreline and how does that move and what happens when you know, there's erosion, is the map incorrect? And if the map is incorrect, then, you know, all these sort of foundational ideas of, of capitalism and 
um, and sort of the capital of scene, I guess you call it, and the plantation of scene are all then um, fair game, right? We can then start to dismantle those things. You know, for me, it's always how do I create this story or talk about this work without constantly naming the oppressor and the colonizer? Like, how do we take them out of it, even though they're there, but they've centralized themselves? And so for me, it's about creating other narratives and that are challenging this notion of a central narrative and that there are multiple um, narratives at play and that I have maybe more, um, more uh, right to being present and maybe for us to think about than what we've been told. I, um, I like, I think that the question of narrative has also been pretty central in my work as well as a tool of um, dealing with the complexities of these histories. Um, you know, in, in my bio, I, I often, in my artist statement, I always say that I deal with the materiality of coloniality. Um, after coming out of school um, in Cuba and having just such a really strong uh, training, my work um, looked so Cuban that people thought I was Cuban in a way because it was so much analyzing the context of that space. And when I came back home and I to the Virgin Islands and I really looked around and thought, okay, how can I approach these skills that I learned to this society and to say something, it was about our coloniality. We've been colonized seven times. We're still a colony of the United States. And when I look around in my lived environment, um, I just started really thinking about the, the different kind of, it was kind of trying to make sense of the stories that are here and, and what we're living, the built heritage of this space and how it impacts us. Um, you know, even the my studio where I'm at is, um, you know, I, I bought it, but not knowing that it was a building from the 1700s where the first uh, owners were enslaved African women who survived the Middle Passage, survived slavery, um, were able to buy themselves out of slavery and own a home in the 1700s is just quite remarkable. And that coming to know that story of my studio space that I bought helped me to begin to reimagine or to begin the process of digging to everything that was around me and beginning to look at the materials and rethinking what are the different kinds of stories. As Deborah said, when, when we think about our town in Christianstad, we know it's named after a Danish king. We think about the Danish brick that were imported and that's how we see it. This is Danish architecture. And we often forget that it's the enslaved Africans who built this this town, that it's their labor, their knowledge, their spiritual traditions, not just their craft traditions, but the way that they thought about materials, the way that they thought about the ocean when they were going into the sea to carve coral stones and put them in the foundations. You know, how does that impact this space that we're all living in? And I think that as an artist, for me, I've really, that's that's been such a central part of my practice these days to really you know, look at the materials and think about what are the other kinds of stories that we can pull out of these materials. Um, I know in particular, um, you know, again, thinking about the history of, we have two towns on St. Croix and one was burnt down by a major labor revolt and it was rebuilt during a time that the, uh, this gingerbread fretwork, which is very also associated with many Caribbean towns became very popular. And I started to really think about the visuality of resistance and how it was marked not only in the towns and how we can, how, is, how, how could I maybe develop that? And I think that's another tool that as artists we use, we, you know, so I, this series called Cuts and Burns where I'm doing these small cuts and burns on paper. For me, we're really thinking about those two main um, tools that enslaved people had to, to, to resist. It was the cutlass and it was fire. <laughs> You know, as 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 Eduardo, you know, the Haitian Revolution was fought with those two things, and um, and so I think you know that's that's just some of the ways that I try to look at our histories, look at the materialities, and try to come up with uh, different visualities to counter the ones that we're constantly bombarded with, also living in these spaces. Um, yeah, I I think I think I it's become more and more important for me in my practice to be really clear about my limitations of what I know and what I don't know. And that has actually um, become really a fruitful way to start. Um, and so what I do know is, um, is not a lot. It's very, uh, it's, um, I look to this landscape that I literally grew up in um, and that can 
quite often be a you know a garden that I know very well. Um, it's also the stories that um, are were passed down to me repeatedly uh, from family or from my community that um, speak to uh, well speak about landscape, but also use the landscape and various different um, tools and uh, kind of emblems to talk about identity and, and morality and um, how to be in the world. And um, rather than that being a kind of form of navel gazing, I, I look at that as a way of um, really embracing uh, the feminine aspects of making work um, about a space that you tend to and a space that is um, generational and really looking away from a kind of masculine amassing or um, amassing or conquering or capitalism, which in my, in my work would be trying to take a kind of uh, story that wasn't very um, specific and familiar. And, and then within that, I'm able to kind of flesh out uh, stories that are, you know, I think um, potentially generational or connected to other people, but uh, the, the limits um, are, are how I deal with with trying to create a new lexicon, I think. Cool. Oh, thank, thank you all for all of that. It is um, truly tremendous to see um, the weaving and the interrelations. Um, so now we're going to move into some direct questions. And Deborah, you're up first. Um, in your work, there is a deep sense of urgency in how you're thinking about the contents of the Black Atlantic. Spiritually and materially, how do your newer photographic and video works begin to address the need for elegies, commemoration, and remembering? Um, it's a great question. <laughs> no, I think um, for me, you know, I, I don't know if it's necessary. I guess it is elegy when I think about it. Um, it's a, you know, it's a space that I've been working with for the you know, for a long time, but really only thinking about the hurricane and the storm for the most part, and then the, the land and going back and forth. And so the, the recent work is, um, you know, looking at the surface of, of the sort of black, you know, see if you see the images, just a black and white um, representation of the surface of the water. Um, but I'm thinking about, you know, in that work, a multitude of things. And so, um, you know, my wall in front of me is full of all kinds of notes and words. And so I'm, I'm, you know, in it, I'm thinking about the Rosby whistle, you know, here is this sound that's emanating from the, the, the sea floor and it's using not a coastline of an island, but um, using the, 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 what the, the land that we can't see under the water. Um, and so thinking about the invisible and the visible, um, and how we experience that is always, um, is, is more and more at the forefront. And then the sort of the residue of that. And so before when I'm always thinking about memory as residue and trace, and especially like rememory um, as trace memory, um, the salt sort of functions as, as that for me. And so even though it was a material that was like sold and, um, you know, and, and had a value that was worth more than gold, like here it is in the very, ocean as well, and it's um, in its unmined state, so to speak. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about those things as well as the weight of the water. Um, I'm very intentional and in not having a lot of blue sea images in my work, right? Because I am thinking about sort of like, what is the weight of, of, of this water, right? In life and the way I experience it and enjoy it is, is a bit, it's different than the way I think of it. Um, within the work. And so um, Dion, um, in Christina Sharp's book, um, there's a M. Nobosi Phillips, um, she mentions the word ex aquis, which is the idea of, of sort of exhuming bodies from water, uh, bodies that were lost at water and honoring them. And so, you know, this work is, I think, in, in relation to that kind of a conversation, that how do we honor the loss? You know, if I see the hurricane as the sort of seasonal, 
memory that na nature has created to remember those lost in the middle passage. Um, this is almost an almost more individual and a little bit more intimate and hands-on for me when I'm working with it. So um, in a sense, that's why it becomes difficult even when thinking about titling them, you know, like I, I look at them and I'm like, should I give them a, a name or should they be a title or should they be um, untitled? Like, what, is, what does that mean? And so, you know, I, I think sometimes I come to my titles after I, I make the work, like a long time after, and they stay untitled. And a lot of that has to do too, just because of the ideas that I'm um, engaged with. I just don't wanna be flippant about that. Um, and so I wait for them to sort of come to me. <laughs> Sounds good. You know, I sort of, I, I, I almost wait for the work to give me the title. Um, and sometimes it takes longer than, than other times, which is frustrating when you think about the structure of, of, of art world, right? People want titles. Um, but that idea of naming, right? And is, is, you know, I think of it as naming. So it becomes then um, a little, you know, a much more important um, to the work. And in, in that sense, it's elegiac. The, the video work tends to call for a certain kind of stillness that um, requires the viewer to sort of be in the space and be present. I use the sound because I think the vibrations do something to the body. Um, when you sit in there, it's kind of a drone, you know, and and so sometimes I go back and forth between that sort of droning abstract sound and then having sort of orchestral and more musical elements and sometimes a vocal element. Um, so all of those are to sort of like create a space and to create a space then that the viewer or the particular, you know, the audience can, um, that transports them or makes them think of something else. Cause I think in that engagement, um, for me, that's the artwork, so much more so than just thinking it's really pretty. I think when you discover that there's something more to it and there might be potential um, beyond enjoyment, there's also this balance between enjoyment and grief and beauty and grief um, and mourning and what that means. I hope that answered your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Edward, um, the next question is for you. Uh, your new president series is ongoing and set to be installed in an exhibition in South Africa in 2022. I wondered if you could speak to how the historical portraiture of Haiti's revolutionary figures in the series uh, connects with your essential themes related to land, sea, nationhood, uh, ideas around revolution, freedom, or cosmologies. Um. Indeed, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm revisiting the history of Haiti to present it to um, South Africans, and uh, it, that's the, I mean, the task that I've been given. And I do, I mean, in asking me that kind of question, it's like really a comparison between the first Black Republic and the latest to join that that uh, uh, appellation. Um, I mean, because apartheid is a big word for slavery, you know? I mean, it sounds exotic or whatever, but it's simply just that the brutality of, uh, of the French system and, and the one that, I mean, took over South Africa in the last 70 years. I mean, it's, very, it's, it's, it's a very Latin history. But I mean, I just wanted to, to see um, also how in the 18th century, how uh, uh, former slaves, and a nation decides, you know, like to build itself from from really, I mean, thousands of of, of uh, different es ethnic groups from uh, West Africa, um, in the middle of, of of a really unrelenting colonial uh, adventure by the Europeans. Um, all of these things I'm trying to, you know, like portray. So, I mean, and I realized doing so that, you know, like the, this portrait of Republican Haitians, uh, this a first uh, uh, wave of, of revolutionary individuals that became, you know, like established as, you know, like, I mean, drivers of the nation, builders of nation. I mean, what did they look like? Because it's quite, I mean, peculiar and quite um, unusual in the, in the, in, in the, in, in the visual world, you know, like to see blacks in position of power. And uh, it's been um, 
I mean, these are not really the work that I'm presenting, but it's fine. I mean, we can talk about that as well. Um, but to bring to the table, I'm very interested also, you know, like for people to see themselves into the, in, in these characters. So I've been, uh, um, I practice my engraving, which I didn't know how to do. So I've been engraving on, on, on mirrors, which is very difficult because all I see is my face. So trying to do somebody else's there is pretty complicated, but it, it's been, um, it's been challenging and now I've just blown a few of them up to quite sizable proportions and uh, just by engraving and it's, uh, it's it's an interesting process and um, I hope they I mean it will give I mean I'm creating a whole body of work that also it talks to um, the, the styles stylistic forms you know I mean the uh, the impression left on me by Johannesburg and other cities I visited the presence you know like the, the of of the dutch and then the brits it's it's all very i mean i'm all incorporating all of these uh, um i mean givens conventions into the work and hopefully I'll, I'll bring something new to the table or at least they'll be revisiting themselves looking at haiti probably and uh, it's I mean, I don't know when this exhibit will, will happen, but I've given myself a few months to do it. I mean, more than a few months and present it here at the studio rather than, you know, like in, and prepare a book and, and film and everything else that they want to do to present it the, whenever the situation is, I mean, somehow calmer in, in I mean, with pandemic in South Africa, which is uh, apparently I mean, it's quite serious there. Yeah. So, Talking about, a, uh, I mean, the, the, the prior p a, a, a picture uh, is very, I mean, part of that exhibit which I'm preparing for South Africa. And it's ba basically the introduction to, to, to the thematic, which is, okay, the, you know, like blacks, you know, like the, the beasts of burden. And uh, it, that's what that particular uh, thing. And I, I always try to make sure that there is in, Whatever symbols, symbology that I had, that, that there's something that can that can either be picked up, generally by the pub, you know, like whomever is looking at it, either by the by the title or the the context of the painting. Um, these are painted on aluminum, uh, basically uh, very few colors and and highlighted with uh, glitter glue. I mean, so um, we, that's why they have that aspect. In this particular one that you have right in front of you was part of the larger installation, which really talked about the migration. But in in that particular installation, it was to talk about what was brought by the by the the, the slaves to the to the new world. Hence, you know, like they, I mean, of course, they came practically empty-handed, but they did bring their you know like their cosmologies, their knowledge, their millinery, you know, like forms of looking at things and. I've tried to condense you know, and, and make people realize that it's a, it, it was a lot that they brought to the new world. And, uh, and of course, you know, the seas, the, the, the different gods that are there, which cover, you know, the whole uh, West African coast, you know, I mean, like they're from, I mean, like we had in Haiti, you know, like the Haitians themselves um, say that we are 200 nations, meaning that 200 different groups from West Africa came to the, to, to that island and um, it was uh, uh, fraught to create problems to have so many different groups and I mean they formed a new <clears throat> a new uh, language I mean basically I mean uh, the, what they call a Creole I mean Haitian Creole but they also formed you know like a, a new religion which is still evolving you know like loosely called you know like Haitian Vodou um, but you know like it's a much more complex uh, uh, a, history than that and that's what i've been trying to i mean these are the kind of things that interest me and i try to portray them and try to give uh, as much information as i can in the canvas thank you so much edward thank you um lavon you're up next um we'd love for you to speak about the i am queen mary project mm -hmm. which is so important in the work around decoloniality and um, this idea of a particular revolutionary memory crossing oceans to be situated in decolonizer space in a temporary context is a kind of a transience and it creates new meaning and understanding of history from within the Caribbean. Can you speak about how it's felt impact 
the felt impact of this work and its potential future? Yes. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, this, this is a project, a multi-year project between myself and the Danish artist, uh, Jeanette Ehlers, who we have both in common, Trinidadian um, parentage. Um, it's really a work that also represents the intersection of our two practices. Um, Jeanette and I met for the first time in 2008 um, in a turning point of both of our artistic practices. Um, that was the first time that I went to Denmark for the first time. It was the first time I went to Denmark and was able to see the level of colonial amnesia and aphasia. Like there wasn't even sometimes language to talk about racism or colonialism. Um, and Jeanette, that was the first time that she went to Ghana to see the impact that uh, Denmark had there in bringing enslaved people to the former Danish West Indies, which is now today the Virgin Islands. Um, and our practices developed around thinking through those issues, but on different sides of the Atlantic for many, many years. And then in around 2014, 15, we were approached to think about doing a monument um, in anticipation of the 100 year centennial anniversary of that transfer from Denmark, uh, from the Virgin Islands from Denmark to the United States. And both of us had different ideas to on our, that really came out of our two different practices. And her idea was really thinking a lot more about the body as a Black Dane living in um, Europe, what that felt like on her body to think through these histories. And for me, I was, you know, as I mentioned before, thinking a lot more about the materiality. And so the coral stones came in as a series of uh, plinth and a base, a, a monument that was thinking about that labor. And as we began to, uh, we decided actually to work together and combine our two projects because it made a lot of sense. Here she had this figure and I had this coral stone base, <laughs> plinth um, type of sculpture. And, um, and then we also decided to uh, merge that upon a heroine in the Virgin Islands. It's called Mary Thomas. She emerges as one of the most popular leaders of the largest labor revolt in Danish colonial history. Um, even though it was after slavery, it was very slavery-like conditions that, that they were fighting and protesting against. Um, and I think your question asked more about like the, the impact or how, is that what it was more? Yeah, um, correct. Well, for Denmark, they have, I think most people don't even think about Denmark as a colonizing nation. You know, they don't actually think of themselves that way. They, once they sold us, they really began a series of very structured unremembering. And that impacted me very greatly for the first time when I went in 2008, it was like a wound because it's almost as if somebody mash your toe and then keep going and they don't even look back to say anything, not even a sorry, but even like, oh, they didn't even remember. You know, it's kind of this question of, how do you not even remember 250 years of your history? So, um, what I think has been most, what the surprising thing that has been most impactful for me was, um, uh, you know, someone sent me a, uh, an image uh, shortly after the inauguration of 2018 of a group of Virgin Islands athletes that had, were in Denmark to do a soccer tournament. And they were all standing around the sculpture with a big Virgin Islands flag. And that I realized that they would never experience the hurt that I felt in 2008. I mean, they walked through the city of Copenhagen and they were like, watch Queen Mary, you know, for them, they would never have felt that feeling of being forgotten or unremembered. Cause I think unremembered is more intentional than forgotten. And, um, but I think that what it does is it creates a permanent marker. It creates a space like we, I would say that our, our work went from being an artwork to a landmark because now it's creating a permanent space to have these dialogues. Art really has this beautiful function of that. Even if you don't like, you know, things about slavery and colonialism can be quite political topics that sometimes people don't know how to enter, but an artwork allows you to kind of step in and not have a readily formulated idea yet, you know, because you're starting to think about, well, this is a black woman in this European city. She has, her feet are barefoot. But, She's wearing these clothes, like she got thing on her head, wrap up, like what? And all of a sudden you're forced to kind of engage with this history um, 
in a in another way and i and i feel like that is probably one of the most impactful things that the piece it forces you also to realize that you know there are a lot of people we we intentionally put a really not a lot of text on the sculpture um and so i think a lot of people when they go to the sculpture they're just kind of like well, what is this about but i think the most impactful thing is to see a two and a half story figure of a black woman in europe all of a sudden it decenters your knowledge base. You all of a sudden realize that there are other people who have heroines that are just important because obviously she's here. <laughs> um, and it makes you kind of begin that questioning and that engagement that I think is really necessary around developing new uh, productions for history. But in terms of the future of that project, although it was temporarily um, positioned in 2018, that was more so because we didn't, the government didn't give us from, to, uh, permanent permission, and we only were able to raise enough money to do it in a more um, temporary uh, fashion. Um, but we are about to launch a crowdsource funding campaign and a full scale fundraising campaign as we now do have the permanent permission, which is super sick. That's also kind of a recognition of the government saying, wow, this temporary artwork that these artists put up, we want this permanently in our city. Um, the government has also put some money towards it and with the condition that we raise the rest. So that's what we're doing right now. And our crowdsource funding campaign is gonna be kicking off later in August. We've just moved the date. Um, so, you know, of course, you know, we're, we're super excited about that. And always as a decolonial project, I think, you know, I just wanted to also signal that we did mention it was supposed to be two monuments. And that's part of the messiness in decolonial work when you're thinking about relationships to power and resources. Most of the money was raised in Denmark, which is why the sculpture went there first. And what we're hoping is to leverage um, the, the attention that that sculpture got to be able to raise one for the Virgin Islands. I'll just end by saying, you know, Jeanette and I, after we did the sculpture in Denmark, we did a three island tour throughout the Virgin Islands to assess people's desire to have the sculpture here because we were pushing into the public space there, but we knew we couldn't do that kind of project here because it, it didn't require that. So we really had to kind of do public engagement to see if people wanted the sculpture here. And it was very beautiful to see many people stand up in those meetings, those public forums and say, our children deserve that image too. And so that's also part of what the crowdsource funding campaign is to ensure that Virgin Islanders also get that monument. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Yvonne. Really powerful project. For those of you who are joining us from everywhere, please remember to pose your questions, um, which we'll get to very soon. Tessa, um, I wanted you, you started a little bit about your relationship with the landscape, but I wanted you to talk about the relationship between the landscape and the human body, because in a, in a number of the, the images, there's like this fusing that's happening between the human body and the landscape where they're kind of bleeding into one another. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about, about your decisions around that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll talk about it in relation to the images as well. If you can bring up the first image, that would be great. The um, this, this is a very large uh, canvas, it's oil paint, and, and it's, called, it's called Portrait. Um, and at the time of making this, I was looking back at um, images of, of my, maternal, uh, um, my maternal family and her ancestry, and um, her paternal side, so my grandfather and beyond, um, went to Jamaica as a um, as missionaries, so they had um, some kind of uh, consistent income and had quite a lot of images to relative a lot of images to like look through and kind of understand the way that they lived. And then my maternal side through my grandmother um, have a kind of a break in their history. Um, as so many Caribbean families do. So there's not a lot of material to look at. And there's also just one image that we have access to, which um, is just the family lined up. Uh, not even all the kids are born. And of course, there's no smile on your face because you can't, you can't risk ruining the picture that you paid somebody to come and take 
It has to be very still and clear. And it's this record of a family. And um, in that particular image, my great grandfather has an arm missing because it was, he lost it in a sugar mill. And I found the two things, the idea that the, um, that the portrait was uh, such a, an important record for, um, for families and how it really is very stoic. Um, there's not a lot of, inf they're not trying to portray a lot of information. There's, it's a very important moment for that family. So there's very little extra activity going on. Everyone's trying to sit as still as possible and just say, we all existed at this one time. But then there's these like snags within the image of giving you a lot of information about the space that they live in. So you can see a little bit of landscape behind and you know that that must be their garden and how that they might have occupied that space. You can see that he's missing an arm and how that related the family to their landscape um, was um, that enters you into lots of different narratives. And um, at the same time, um, I was, as I was thinking about that, I was teaching my nephew how to use a film camera. And so we were performing for him to be able to get a very still image. And so this is from an image he took of me and other family members. And I found the same kind of overlap of that, trying to just be very still and capture something that was very immediate and just recording a moment. But of course there's these little snags and um, uh, that can kind of unfold into much larger um, stories about, about the space around you um, and how you're occupying it, whether you're barefoot, whether you're not wearing a lot of clothing and how that might kind of uh, tell you more about that family. It's almost like sifting through a, um, a kind of, uh, somebody else's photo album or like a series of other people's photo albums um, when you go into an, you know, a secondhand store. Um, and then I also added another artwork, if you don't mind bringing up image two, sort of different uh, idea of how to occupy this space with um, a body. This came from us, um, the kind of impetus for this artwork was I was, at a church service and I, we were told the sermon about Jesus meeting Simon at the Sea of Gal Galilee and uh, telling Simon and his the fellow fishermen that if they, if, he, if they gave their entire faith to him, they would become catching men. And in that moment of imagining this space by the ocean and you know, going out and with absolute faith of becoming catching men, my fallibility imagined that they would catch the wrong thing. And I uh, thought about how you can't, you kind of can't ever escape that physical body of yours within this space. Um, you're so attached to your humanness. It's, it's can be quite comical, you know, that kind of trickster plays into that as well. And so I created this sculpture to move, to kind of parade through a space, to parade through the, a landscape that speaks to, um, you kind of carry the skeleton and the skeleton carries you. And it sort of speaks to that um, inability to escape your, uh, your physical corporal self. And um, that definitely ties into to a kind of parade, parade uh, mentality that we, definitely have in the Bahamas for Junk Canoe. And, and I, I've never seen Trinidad Carnival in person, but understand that the imagery also speaks to that kind of, this is our absolute humanness being splayed out onto the landscape for this period of time. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for that, Tessa. Um, I think we have a couple of questions. Um, so if we can pull up our first question. We only have a few minutes left, so we'll have to be brief in our responses. I'm wondering how much responsibility artists and cultural producers have in how they engage with the art markets and artwork systems that are built on and continue to function as colonial frameworks. 
don't know if anybody wants to take that from Live, Love, Learn. Thank you for your question. Anybody wants to respond to that? How are we responding to the art market? Is this, the question is from the standpoint of the Caribbean, if I understand correctly. I mean, I would say, because the, the, the final part of that question, is it continuing to function as colonial frameworks would suggest that we've inherited a particular framework, um, economic in particular, perhaps? Anybody wants to engage that? <laughs> It's, I think it's a, it's a really difficult question to ask artists, you know, also on the eve of something that is a, uh, an art fair that's online. And I, but I think it's an interesting question to ask artists in, in the context of where we are at this moment. You know, I can just, I mean, I think we can all speak to the challenges, um, especially Tessa and myself who are uh, based here in the Caribbean of making a living as an artist. I mean, a lot of the work, uh, you know, unlike in maybe some other places, like I know in Denmark, there are a lot of artists who are able to operate outside of the art market framework and directly receive funding through institutions um, and have their work supported in that way. But in the Caribbean, um, that's not really possible. And so uh, artists, I mean, the average person here, for example, has to work two jobs. So an artist even much more so. Um, so I, I'm not, I think the question is more like a judgment and then asking how we either feel about that or engage with that. And I, I think, you know, cause that's the first part that there's kind of like this judgment that we've inherited a kind of a colonial framework by selling our work. And I, I'm not, exactly so sure if I would agree with that statement. I mean, I'm curious what some of the artists think. Um, I would I would echo what you're saying. I completely agree. Does That is kind of a question we get asked a lot here about kind of like, how do you, almost like a, how do you manage question? Mm -hmm. And I find it's, it's hard not to be almost offended by it and just be like, well, we've actually got a lot of what we need. Um, in the space, um, I find that the audience make, well makes up for a lot of the difficulties because the it's such we have such an engaged audience and it's such a, an engaged community of people to, who are interested in what you make and want to have ownership over it and talk about it. Um, it seems it seems to it seems to be counterproductive to have to work beyond this, to have to work beyond this space. I mean, of course, it's a joy to work beyond this space, but to have to work beyond this space seems, seems, I don't know, problematic maybe. Well, it's also too like, you know, it's one of those questions that comes also from, uh, it, it, in a way, it's almost like a privilege to ask the question, right? <laughs> um, because if you are like in the, in this space, like what does it mean to work in the art market? Well, it's as problematic as like, you know, driving a car given how I feel about fossil fuels. Like, I don't necessarily like them, they're bad for the environment, but will I walk a thousand miles or will I drive a thousand miles, right? And so if you're in the Caribbean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's literally like that. I mean, if in this space, um, of the Atlantic. There's certain parts of the Atlantic where, you know, if you're looking at more opulent places and places that have more resources, there are more resources for artists, right? And so you can pick and you can say, well, I don't want to work with a, a gallery. I only want to work with nonprofits or my government will only give me, well, you know, whatever non-funding I can get. Um, whereas other people don't have the options like, well, like, look, somebody wants to buy it and they're in a, a gallery. I want to pay my rent with this. I'm already engaged in, a, in an art form or a kind of labor that doesn't have a lot of, of, of economic, you know, stability. And so, sometimes I think when I hear these questions, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I get a little, well, I get a little offended. Well, a lot offended because I think it comes from a point of privilege. And I think it's, it's great to say no. And there are people who, who do and are able to negotiate a certain space. But you know, all those things get complicated when you. You build them out. Are those um, now? There's some colonial structures within the museum system that might be like highly problematic. But 
you know, you can choose to engage with them from outside or you could try to engage with them from the inside and then have your own sort of personal like line, right? And you're like, okay, I won't associate with a space that has like stolen goods or, you know, or, or I won't even have that conversation. So there are ways I think that, you know, as an artist, you can negotiate um, with institutions. And, and I think for those who can, who have the privilege and are able and the financial freedom to, 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 to you know, protest those things and raise those questions without having um, too much repercussions, it's okay. And then for some, it's not, it's not possible at the moment, right? And so we're all sort of like negotiating um, these spaces and it calls for constant negotiation. I, I always say like, when you live on, a, on an island and a small island, you always have to deal with these sort of negotiations, right? Because you can't like, you know, you don't wanna, if you live in a large continental sort of space, you know, like something where you can go, you know, and drive away, go to another state. Um, you know, oftentimes in the Caribbean, the person that you don't like is a person that you will run into at the supermarket in the tax line. They may be your bank teller. They might be the person that's to give you a loan. Um, you know, it's small. So all of a sudden, like you just, you know, you can't give everybody the finger. <laughs> Right? Because you're, you're going to need that person when the hurricane comes. He might be the one selling you the plywood, right? And so, um, so those are the negotiations you have to have, like in a smaller space. So, understanding that nuance is then sort of understanding how that question becomes problematic to answer. But at the same time, we have to celebrate what's going on right now, today, with the uh, with this uh, effort that has been you know, like organizing, you know, like the Caribbean as a region, which is, you know, like probably more interesting than just every island on its own trying to figure out what to do with its culture, what to do with its uh, artists, and how do they manage, and and it's very complicated. So, I mean, I celebrate this, uh, uh, and I wanted to participate to see how this would evolve, what it would evolve into, because this is the first one of, of, of its type, and that's really, I mean, and, and uh, the, the, the question is, that's the answer to the question. We do have to do something about it. And we have uh, uh, an effort being done right there and now. And let's see what it, uh, how it evolves and how it plays out for all of the artists. Because, I mean, that's, I mean, galleries and, and art markets are, after this year of pandemic, we have to realize that they are changing really fast. And what we are doing right now is probably a solution or at least an attempt at a certain solution of, of how to present ourselves, how to present our work and how to organize, our, you know, like reg regionally. And probably this will live on for a while. I mean, I don't see what's going to replace this format in the, in the near future, you know, so. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me? There's, there's so much, there is so much so happening. Fair. And so right. much to celebrate at the moment. It really feels like a renaissance happening in the Caribbean. So many people are producing a lot of very, very powerful work. Um, so we are out of time. I wanted to um, thank uh, Edward, Levon, Deborah, and Tessa for being so generous in sharing your practices today and for allowing us to understand and access your work. Um, thank you for that. Thank you also to Susie Wong Presents in Jamaica and Turn Gallery, who are partners in shaping this panel. Uh, please remember that Sour Grass, Susie Wong Presents, and Turn Gallery booths are all live with works that you can purchase to grow your Caribbean art collections. And thank you especially to Black Pony Gallery and Lisa for the invitation to all of us to be part of this exciting new venture. Lisa has done a stellar job in steering the ship. And do remember to tune in next Wednesday, June 9th, for a big day of programming. Starting at 11 a.m. EST, we kick, off, we kick off with Art Talk, Collecting Culture, Jamaican Style, hosted by Olympia Gallery and Frame Center Gallery, followed by an IG Live session at 12 p.m. with Evelyn Spikes and BD Brown, hosted by Black Pony Gallery and Gallery Alma Blau from Curacao. And finally, the program later that day, starting at 2 p.m., is another IG Live hosted by Turn Gallery, featuring Melissa Alcina and Delton Barrett. And in closing today's conversations, once again, we would like to express huge thanks to Artsy for hosting this inaugural Atlantic World Art Fair.
and to the other eight participants from across the Caribbean who we are absolutely delighted to be collaborating with. Please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel at Atlantic World Art Fair and follow us on Atlantic World Art Fair at Instagram. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, thank you. Please to meet thank you Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. That was good.